record up first. As we all know, Jeanette does a brilliant uh, talk here about um, the legal aspects of running a business. Uh, today, I believe you're talking about the contracts that we need when we're dealing with family members as well. Because yes, we might think that we've got a great relationship with our family, but when a business starts going the wrong way or there's um, it's going too, very well, there will be those that will argue about the agreements that they originally had verbally. So, uh, Jeanette, if you'd like to take us through this, I'm no, I'm looking, I'm wait, waiting and looking forward to listening to it. Thank you very much, Alan. Okay, so the reason I want to talk about this is it's become more prevalent lately. So we've had a number of inquiries from people who are looking at, particularly in the current economic environment, um, sharing properties is a big thing, um, lending money, uh, requests for money, but also going into business together and what that looks like and who gets what and all of these sorts of things. So the first thing I wanted to, I just, I think I might just run through some case studies so you can see the kind of things that I'm talking about. Um, we, a few months ago, we had uh, an instance where an older, el elderly, let's call them elderly, they're in their 80s, uh, an elderly couple purchased a property. On that property, there was a shed with a, basically a loo in it. Um, the Their kids contributed some money to the purchase price and renovated the shed into a livable dwelling um, you know this was all done with council approvals and everything but the title is in the name of the parents so the ownership of the property is in the name of the parents and the kids are a bit concerned that they protect their investment um, and the parents are a bit concerned that they don't want to be the subject of elder abuse or kicked out of the property or restricted in their ability to sell the property if they need to purchase a place in care our care facility uh, so we put together an agreement that facilitated that for that family now it did take a couple of months to get it over the line and there were some tricky things in there because um, the kids who renovated are continuing to contribute some money to the property so their proportionate interest in the property is going to adjust over time and we had to put some mechanisms in there to recognize that without damaging the position of the parents um, and we've managed to do that without having to put their names on title so the elder parents feel a lot more secure um, that's one situation and it was really important for that family to nut that out now it was difficult it was emotional the people in the room who work with particularly supporting families and parents would understand how difficult some of these conversations can be but it's very worthwhile and we now have a mechanism in place that if anything goes wrong in the future um, if any party dies if there's divorces all of those things have been considered and dealt with in this agreement so the family is very happy and the the other the child who doesn't live on the property and has no interest in the current interest in the property but may well inherit some interest um, is also they've seen the agreement and they've made their comments we haven't acted for them but they are happy with it as well so we've got a happy family that has certainty in terms of going forward even if they end up in a situation of dispute um, and if there was nothing in writing that certainty would not be there and the ability to deal with a problem quickly and easily and inexpensively would not be there. What you'd end up in is um, a situation like a court case I read last week. Um, so the decision was just recently handed down. It was around things that happened in 2019 um, where some money went into a property from parents to a child. Um, there was a divorce, there was an argument over who owned what and who was entitled to what and all sorts of things. Um, and that went through an entire court proceeding. So they would have spent over $100,000 in legal fees, um, probably $100,000 each in legal fees to get a decision where the court said, well, actually, the kids have to pay the parents 40 grand, 40 grand. They've spent 200,000 to get a decision that amounted to 40 grand. Whereas if they had spent a couple of grand up front, 
that could have all been documented clearly. There's no problems with, oh, I remembered it that way versus I remembered it that way. And people's memories are fallible. I mean, who in the room can tell me what they had for lunch last Wednesday? One person, <laughs> two, three, four. Okay, a few people. Okay, what about Wednesday a year ago? Not a chance. It's no different with contracts around, you know, that involve money or businesses or properties or anything like that. Your memory fails. Um, so it's really important to get these things documented. Another really recent example was where a um, some parents are moving or they have already moved into their child's property, but they're going to, they sold their house and they're going to contribute a few hundred thousand dollars into renovating this property. They don't want to be on title because they're entitled to a pension and they don't want to impact their pension. So we had to review all of the ways in which to put that agreement together so we don't impact their pension so that their investment in their kids' property can count as their principal place of residence, which is not counted for pensions and all of that sort of thing. So we've put that agreement together for them. And the kids don't seem to be particularly worried about that. Not surprisingly, they're about to benefit by a couple of hundred thousand dollars and an increased value to their home. Um, but the parents want to ensure that they have the ability to live somewhere until they pass away or until the property is sold and what happens with the money they've put into renovating at the time of sale. So we've clarified all of that for them. Other situations where things go haywire, siblings going into business together. Oh my goodness me, people who have loved each other and been mess, best mates their entire lives get to a point where one of them doesn't want to work anymore or one of them's not contributing to the business anymore and because money is involved and livelihood is involved things go pear-shaped awfully quickly and you end up with siblings who don't speak to each other anymore now how are you ever going to resolve a difficulty if people don't speak to each other funnily enough if you've got a document in place if you've got something in writing then and that was put together well in the first place then there's a mechanism there to resolve that situation so if one's not speaking to the other you at least have a way forward um, so any sort of business relationship whether it's a supply agreement or it's both people in the same business together or anything like that um, we strongly recommend it doesn't matter if you're family members please document it because you're spending investing a small amount of money now to save a very large amount of money later we had um, not not family members, but friends get together into a business. Oh, no, it's great. We'll do it on a handshake. Fabulous. Um, two years into operations, one found out the other one was doing some funny things with some of the money in the business and it didn't seem to be profitable all of a sudden. Um, because there was nothing documented up front, they spent 12 months and several tens of thousands of dollars with lawyers trying to get to a point of resolution um, it's not resolved so they're both threatening to take it to court against each other but the problem is court is going to cost a lot of money and neither of them want to invest any more money and so the business bank account has three hundred and forty thousand dollars sitting in it frozen that nobody can access because there's no resolved dispute you know, there's silly circumstances that a small investment up front and some time and then some effort when everybody gets on would resolve these things and stop these things happening down the track. Um, so, and any instance of lending money, some, I have heard some people express an opinion, oh no, it's family, nobody's going to enforce that in court. Don't you believe it? You lend money to somebody 
and you want that money back, a court will hear your argument and it doesn't matter that they're a family member, the court will treat it as a commercial agreement and they will apply what they believe should have been the agreement in the first place if you didn't bother to document it. Um, so I have seen family members saying, oh no, it'll never happen, it'll never go to court because it was my mum or whatever who lent me the money, no court's ever gonna listen to that. Yes, yes, they are. Okay, so loans between family members, loans are very easy to document. Um, it's not hard to make them clear. It's not hard to um, put in provisions that say, actually, it doesn't have to be repaid unless one of these trigger circumstances happen. Um, and that could be the parties end up in dispute. <laughs> okay, so there you go. There's some things I just wanted to highlight for you to think about if you know anyone running into those sort of circumstances who could benefit from maybe thinking through getting something documented now. Happy to have a chat with them to see if we can help. Um, and yeah, please, if you intend to do anything like that in the future, please document it. It's really important. And the clearer it's documented, um, the better. All right. Excellent. That's one of the things I've always said and that the relationships go awry with bad memories and you know, people just don't remember what they said last week. And always the pictures change. So desperately needed. Anybody got any questions for Jeanette, just put your virtual hand up and um, we'll go through them one by one. I'm scared, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Sabrina. Jeanette, I'm just curious, um, just a little bit of topic. I understand having something in place with your family members and all of that, but regarding it business-wise, because I'm in Victoria, would you look at service agreements if they are? Um, yeah. So know. there's a, the way the way business works is, in Australia is most laws associated with business are national, <laughs> mm -hmm. which means it doesn't matter where you are in Australia, we can help you. Okay. Then. Um, things like property law, like leasing, that's state based. So we're in Queensland. We help people in Queensland in that area. Um, but yeah, anything, business agreements, service agreements, contractors, that kind of thing, employment, if you're in Australia, we can help you. Okay. Excellent. And Peter? Uh, okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much indeed. That, that's really very good. Uh, and it's something that I've always told my clients for years, because that's exactly what happens. It doesn't matter if they're best friends, uh, their relatives, whatever, um, that, that does happen. I think it's absolutely essential um, to have an agreement because uh, you have an agreement when you're happy, uh, when it all falls apart, uh, you don't fall out. And, that, and that's that's really helpful. Um, and um, uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you. And Stuart. Excellent. And I'm I'm back. Hopefully I'm not clicking. There's yeah, a bit of a- um, good. Great. Excellent. Got it. Got to love a good uh, turn it off and on again. Bit of an IT <laughs> tip there. Um, excellent. So, so Jeanette, thank you so much. I cannot attest to this, um, having things documented. And as a matter of fact, I have got, uh, a couple of referrals to send through. So thank my you. question to you is what's the best process? Because step one, um, I've got the, the two individual things. One is around an agreement that you just mentioned timely. Excellent. And the other one is somebody that's, that just needs advice on some, um, some financial due process. How would one refer to you okay so the best way is an email introduction to say hey this is Jeanette I mentioned her to you um Jeanette this is so and so I mentioned them to you um in terms of people who want to um, just have an advice session we have a short advice session which is um, a 20 minute zoom conversation or else we can respond to a couple of short questions on email um, that zoom conversation is up to 20 minutes and that's 220 dollars and we often resolve everyone's problems in that 20 minutes and allow them to move on with confidence and give them peace of mind um, the other option, like where it's an agreement, the best way is to make that email introduction and then we can have a quick chat with them, which doesn't have a cost associated to find out um, what it is, they, what solution they're looking for. And then we let them know if we can help them and what their investment will be um, to do so. 
Okay. Excellent. Thank you very, very much. Um, expect no some emails. <laughs> Thank you. And, and Mark. Jeanette, very informative as per normal. Um, I Thank suppose you. Come to expect that. My question to you is partnership agreements and succession planning. Do you include yeah. that in a partnership agreement? You can do. Um, so uh, when, so where we caution against partnerships mainly because of the liability um, so in terms of a partnership the best example I can give is I worked with a law firm and after I had left um, one of the partners went to jail for trust account fraud um, one of the other partners who had nothing to do with it knew nothing about it but actually owned property in his own personal name was the one they took to court and had to pay the three million dollars that was missing um, that's why I don't like partnerships. Um, I much prefer other structures, but regardless of the structure that you put together, um, yes, you can put succession planning provisions into any sort of business structure arrangement. So whether it's a joint venture, whether it's a company in the shareholder agreement, um, whether it's a partnership agreement, you can specify those sorts of things moving forward. And in actual fact, that does provide greater clarity for anyone who has to look after an estate after um, someone is deceased or after they go, you know, lose capacity and go into care or anything like that. Thank you. Excellent. And Nathan, this will be the last one. Yeah, so on that partnership thing, Mark, um, we agree completely with Jeanette, never, ever, 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 ever <laughs> go into a partnership, ever. If you actually go into a partnership, set up a company and the two companies, they become partners. Right, because then you've actually got that limited liability surrounding that. But we also say one structure, one one event. So if you're doing a business, you put your business in it. If you're doing investing, you put your investments into a different company. So there's never mixing, ever. But yeah, thanks, Jeanette. It was a great presentation. Completely agree with everything you just said. <laughs> thanks, Nathan. And thanks very much. I'll just uh, stop the recording first of all.